Are you ready for the word? Yes. Turn to Matthew chapter 1. Matthew 1, look in verse 18. Now the birth of Yeshua the Messiah was on this wise. Is it December? Doesn't matter, does it? December has absolutely nothing to do with his birth. The birth of Yeshua the Messiah was on this wise. When as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph before they came together, she was found with child of the Ruach HaKadosh. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privately. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of Yahweh appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, you son of David, fear not to take unto you Mary your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Ruach HaKadosh. She shall bring forth a son, thou shalt call his name, what does it say in your Bible? Okay, a little hesitant to say it. He, thou shalt call his name Jesus, it says, for he shall save his people from their sins. We'll talk about that in a moment. Well, last week we talked about the lie that's known as the Roman road to salvation. You cannot take four or five verses in the book of Romans and get people to say a sinner's prayer and ask Jesus into their heart and secure salvation by doing that. That's a lie. It does not work. That's not how it works. That's not how a, a salvation is obtained. Um, and we'll put a link to that sermon either in the description or on the screen when we put this to YouTube. But in that sermon we talked last week about how that the Roman road to salvation as it is presented is a lie. Well, as much as I am eager... Uh, to move on and get back into the book of Enoch. I cannot do so until we have looked um, at some things that we need to know about salvation. I couldn't just leave last week hanging and not follow up uh, today. It's not enough to tell you that the Roman presentation of sal Roman road presentation to salvation is a falsehood. I got to also tell you what the scriptures actually say about obtaining salvation. Uh, it's my desire to make this easy uh, to follow, uh, to make it uh, easy to understand because there are eternal consequences involved in this subject. <clears throat> so let's begin by looking at what this angel told Joseph in Matthew 1. The first thing that we're made to know by that angel is this, that salvation is the work of Yahweh. Salvation is the work of Yahweh. The child in Mary was of the Ruach Kakadesh. So it was Yahweh who initiated the plan that would bring salvation to us. Ephesians 2 says it this way, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourself. It is the gift of Yahweh. So it's a gift that he gives to us. It is his work. Salvation is all about what Yahweh did and what Yahweh does. The fact that it is Yahweh who does it is also revealed in the very name that Joseph was commanded to give to this child. Uh, why has history changed the name of the Messiah? Because if they change the name, then they can change the means and the method of salvation. I'm going to say that again. They change the name because if they change the name, they can change the means and the method of salvation. If, it's, if you change the name, it sounds like it says, you'll call his name Jesus and he, Jesus, shall save his people from their sins. Well, that's a falsehood. It won't work like that. And that's the reason the name's been changed. But if you change the name and read verse 21 that way, then you can fabricate a Messiah named Jesus and fabricate, fabricate a doctrine that says that he'll save you if you ask him into his heart or ask him into your heart. But that's not what verse 21 says. Verse 21 says that his name shall be called Yahshua. The first part of that name is Yah or Yahweh. Second part of that name is um, Yasha or Shua. And to put them together, it means what? Yahweh. 
Yahweh saves, or Yahweh is salvation. It means that he brings deliverance, brings salvation, he sets free. Yahweh does that. You'll call his name Yahshua, for he, Yahweh, shall save. You'll call him Yahweh saves because that's what's going to happen. Yahweh is going to save, all right? Salvation is the work of Yahweh. Every time we say the name Yeshua, we're saying Yahweh saves. So a person who needs to be saved and wants to be saved, but has been taught certain lies, cannot be saved. And here's what I mean. If they've been taught to say a sinner's prayer, ask Jesus into their heart, if they've been taught that there's no way to know the Creator's real name, that it really doesn't matter anyway, all you got to do is call on Jesus. If they've been taught that, they cannot be saved saved. It would go against everything scripture says to believe that that's possible. Salvation originates with Yahweh and anyone desiring to be saved has to call upon him. We saw that last week in Romans chapter 10 verse 13 says this, whosoever shall call upon the name and in the King James it says the Lord shall be saved. But that is a direct quotation from Joel 2.32. You go look it up in Joel 2.32 the Tetragrammaton is there. It is the proper name of Yahweh. So it literally says, whoever shall call upon the name of Yahweh shall be saved. And then in the verses that follow, Paul asks these questions. How can people call on Yahweh if they've not believed in him? How can they believe in him if they've never heard of him? How can they hear of him if there's not a preacher? And how can there be a preacher unless he gets sent? Okay? So people have been lied to and given a false sense of security when they're told that they got saved by saying some prayer and asking Jesus into their heart. They've got to have heard of and believed in Yahweh and called upon Him to be saved. It is a doctrine of men that cannot be validated anywhere in Scripture to say all you got to do is believe in Jesus and ask Him into your heart. The scriptures teach us that until men have heard a preacher preach Yahweh and have believed in him and believed in what he did, they cannot be saved. He was, and let me say it this way, it was he, Yahweh, that so loved the world that he gave. You understand most folks never get the first part of that? They, they want to talk about what Yeshua did, and there's no name above his name. I understand that. He, he's been lifted high, exalted high. He's at the right hand of the Father. But they forget that it's Yahweh that so loved the world that he set this plan into motion. It was he who commended his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, the Messiah died for us. Well, the angel speaking to Joseph in Matthew 1 made it clear that salvation is of Yahweh and from Yahweh. Knowing that salvation is the work of Yahweh, we, th we can clearly then make these three quick points. Quick may have been overstated. We can make these points. Salvation is necessary. Salvation is expensive. And salvation is of the Jews. Salvation is necessary it's expensive, and it's of the Jews. Let's start with the first one. Salvation is necessary. Yahweh sent Yeshua to save us from something. Matthew 1 told us that. What did he send him to save us from? The law? Did he come to get us out from under the bondage of the law? Nowhere in all of the Bible is the law ever referred to as bondage. That's a doctrine of men. You'll never find that in the scriptures anywhere, that the law was referred to as bondage. We're told that the law was good and just and holy, but we're never told that it's bondage. Yahweh set in motion a plan to save us from something else. What was it he sent him to save us from? Say it. Matthew 120, uh, yeah, 121. Save us from? Sins. Our sins. Thank you very much. What is sin? So could we not say Yahweh gave his only begotten son, sent his son to save us from transgressing the law or our transgressions of the law. 
So if Yahweh was working in Yeshua to save us from our sins, he is working to save us from our transgressions of the law. And, and he has to do that because in order to be in covenant, you have to have terms of a covenant. You cannot have a covenant without terms. You agree with that? Amen. Yahweh entered into covenant with Israel on Mount Sinai and he made clear the terms of that covenant. And he said to them, if you will this, obey me here, then I will this. If you'll do this, I will be your Elohim. You shall be my people. We'll be in covenant together. Torah was the terms of the covenant. That covenant's based upon the terms listed in Torah. When those terms were violated, not by Yahweh, but by Israel. When those terms were violated, Yahweh could have said, all right, y'all had your chance. I gave you an awesome opportunity. Y'all messed it up. Too bad. I'm out of here. But he didn't. Before the foundation of the world, he set in motion a plan to save us from our transgressions of the law. It is tragic and disgusting that most people are taught that he did this by abolishing the law. How can he save us from our transgressions of the law by abolishing the law? That's absurd. It makes no sense at all. Every covenant has to have terms. And when you go look at what people call the new covenant, it's really a renewed covenant. It's not a new one as in never having existed. It is a renewed covenant. Yahweh renewed the other covenant. When he renewed it, he, had, he used the exact same terms of the new, renewed covenant as he did with the former covenant. It's still based on Torah. He changed us, not Torah. He, he said, I'm going to change your stony hearts. And I'm going to put my law in your hearts and in your minds. But if we're going to be in covenant, we've got to have terms, and the terms have not changed. The only thing that needed changing was you. So that's what regeneration, rebirth, recreation is all about. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says this, Therefore, if any man be in the Messiah, he is a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of Yahweh. Who hath reconciled us to himself by Yeshua the Messiah and has given to us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit that Yahweh was in the Messiah reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and has committed unto us the word of reconciliation. So notice he says there that he recreated us and that Yahweh reconciled us to himself and that he was in Yeshua reconciling us to himself that Yahweh did not impute our trespasses to us. So in this renewal, he made us new, and then he worked in Yeshua to reconcile us and bring us back to himself. So sal salvation was and is necessary. We need to be reconciled. We had sinned. The wages of sin is death. And Yahweh chose to impute our sins to the Messiah instead of to us. That is, he took our sins and he put them on Yeshua's tab and he took Yeshua's tab of righteousness, Yeshua's righteousness, and he put that on our tab. So salvation is necessary. Had Yahweh not done this for us, then we would die in our sins. That is, perish, be separated from our creation, creator. Salvation is necessary. He had to save us from our trespasses. Salvation is expensive. Any person who can live in an unsaved condition and not be in a constant state of emotional torment is a person who does not understand how desperately they need to be saved. Look in Luke chapter 22 for a moment. Yeshua and the disciples have gone out into the Mount of Olives to pray. It's the night he's going to be arrested. Let's pick up that narrative there in verse 39. And he came out and went as he was wont, or as was his habit, to the Mount of Olives. And his disciples also followed him. 
And when he was at the place, he said unto them, Pray that ye enter not into temptation. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast, and kneeled down and prayed, saying, Father, if you be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in an agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was, as it were, great drops of blood falling down to the ground. Yeshua knew what was coming and he's desperately seeking another way to obtain salvation for us. He knew what was coming and he's saying to the Father, is there not another way to do this? Remove this cup from me. Please do not make me drink this. And I'm convinced that it's not the physical torment that he's about to endure that has him pleading to the Father. Because he's the one who taught men saying, if any man will come after me, let him take up his cross and follow me. He understood there would be some suffering involved. He's the one who said that when we're persecuted, we're to rejoice. And persecuted in the way that he used it, and in that day and time, did not mean that someone disagreed with you on Facebook. It means that somebody pursued you for the purpose of harassing you, assaulting you, or even killing you. Paul persecuted the believers, we read in the book of Acts. What did that mean? He pursued them, he beat them, he threw them in prison, and even stoned them to death. So Yeshua said, when they persecute you, rejoice. He's about to go through some persecution. It's not the persecution that has him in agony. If he said we should rejoice when we're persecuted, I don't see how we can think that the persecution he's about to endure would have him agonizing in the garden. He's in so much agony that his sweat became as drops of blood. What's causing him such ag agony? He knows the price for transgressing the law. Most people do not know the price, but he did. He knew that the sins of the world were going to be placed on him, and the price for that was ex extremely and tremendously expensive. In Luke chapter 16, in Luke chapter 16, he told the story of a rich man who died. What happened to the rich man? He lifted up his eyes being in torment, it says. He lifted up his eyes in Sheol in torment. He could find no relief and there was no remedy for his condition. He was there and would be there forever separated from Yahweh in a constant state of agony. Yeshua, who told that story, knew that he was going to that place because he was going to die a sinner, though he had never sinned. Ephesians 4 9 tells us that before he ascended, he descended first into the lower parts of the earth where Sheol is. So if a person who is not saved does not fear death and does not fear Sheol, their arrogance reveals their ignorance. If a person who is unsaved does not fear death, their arrogance reveals their ignorance. Yeshua knew. He, do you, you agree with me? He knew. He didn't budge on this at all. He knew that on the third day he would rise again. How many times did he say it? On third day. On the third day I will rise again. But just being in that place for three days 
caused him great agony. The thought of being there for three days caused him to sweat drops of blood. The rich man was in it and it was so agonizing he begged Abraham, send somebody to warn my brothers. I can't get out of here. I can't get out of here. But please don't let my brothers come here. Go warn them. And what did Abraham say to the rich man? They have Moses. And the prophets. Let your brothers hear them. Let your brothers listen to Moses and let the brothers listen to what's written by the prophets. This story of Yeshua sweating drops of blood reveals that if anyone else besides him dies and they die lost, they die with no hope of ever being rescued from that place. And if they only knew what he knew, and that is how terrifyingly horrible the place is, they could not rest until they called upon Yahweh for salvation. <clears throat> salvation is of Yahweh. All have sinned. Salvation is necessary because all have sinned. And salvation is expensive. The wages of sin is death. And that speaks of going to a place of the unrighteous dead and being tormented there. One more important point. Salvation is of the Jews. I want you to look in Matthew 1 again. Go back there. I want you to see this. <clears throat> Matthew 1 verse 21. She shall bring forth a son. You shall call his name Yeshua. For he, Yahweh, shall save who? Yes. His people. Say it out loud. His people. His people. Hmm. He's going to save his <coughs> people. You can't read the Bible without knowing who that is. That's Israel. Exodus 3.10 <clears throat> Yahweh said to Moses, Come now therefore, I'll send you unto Pharaoh that you may bring forth my people, the children of Israel out of Egypt. Exodus 5.1 And afterward Moses and Aaron went in and told Pharaoh, Thus saith Yahweh the Elohim of Israel, Let my people go that they may hold a feast unto me in the, the, in the wilderness. Numerous other times Moses and Aaron go at the request of Yahweh. They go and stand before Pharaoh and said, Thus saith Yahweh, let my people go. In Exodus 8, 23, uh, before another plague comes, Yahweh sends this message to Pharaoh. I, I will put a division between my people and your people. Tomorrow, Shall this sign be? I'm going to put a, a protection, a cover over the land of Goshen. That's where my people are. You're going to see what's going to happen to your people. And that's when the plague of the flies came. Didn't go into Goshen. Went into Egypt. All right. Jeremiah 7.22 for I spake not unto your fathers, nor commanded them in the day that I brought them out of the land of Egypt concerning burnt offerings or sacrifice, sacrifices. But this thing commanded I them, saying, Obey my voice, and I will be your Elohim. You shall be my people. And walk ye in all the ways that I have commanded you, that it may be well with you. So, or well unto you. So, Yahweh said, Obey my voice, I'll be your Elohim, and you'll be my people. So Israel is his people. Matthew chapter 10. Look there with me. <clears throat> Verse 5. These twelve Yeshua sent forth and commanded them saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into the city of the Samaritans enter ye not. But go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out de devils. Freely you have received, freely give. He did not send them to the Gentiles. 
He said to the Canaanite woman in Matthew 15, 24, who came to him saying, my daughter is vexed with the devil. He said to her in Matthew 15, 24, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Did he mean that or not? Why have we never been taught that? That Matthew 1, 21 says he'll save his people. In Matthew 10, he sent the disciples to his people. In Matthew 15, he said to that woman, I was sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Yeah, that woman received the crumbs that fell from the table and her daughter who was vexed by a daughter was delivered. But Yeshua still plainly said to her, I am not sent but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Matthew 1 21, Yahweh will save his people. Look in John 4. John 4 19. <coughs> The woman said unto him, Sir, you remember this woman at the well? He had just told her, you, you've had five husbands and the one you're with now is not even your husband. And that's when she said, Sir, I perceive that you're a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain and you say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Yeshua answered, said unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour comes when you shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Listen to what he said to her now. You worship, you know not what. We know what we worship. How do we know? How did he say we know? For salvation is of the Jews. This woman is claiming she's a worshiper. She claimed that she was of the lineage of Jacob. Yet because of her approach to worshiping Yahweh, because that approach that she had in worshiping Yahweh was different than the approach that was taught to Israel, Yeshua said to her, you don't know what you're worshiping. You've made up your own ideas, come up with your own plans, come up with your own schemes on how to worship and where to worship. You don't know what you're doing. And that's the plight of most people today. I'm not saying they don't have zeal. I'm not saying they don't have sincerity. I'm not saying they don't claim to be the children of Abraham and worshipers of God. But if you're not following the instructions that Yahweh gave to Israel on how to have a relationship with him and on how to worship him, your worship is in vain. You worship you know not what. It's worship and it can sound beautiful and it can be uplifting. It can be amazing, but it is in vain if it's not the way Yahweh taught Israel how to do it. And this is not a Gatorade dumping service, India. <laughs> Come on. The reason why men are confused on how to be saved and on how to worship is because they've never been taught that salvation is of the Jews. They think that Gentiles can call on Jesus, Jesus and worship God in a Gentile way, but that's not so. The Bible says there's neither Jew nor Greek. Is that correct? But it does not say there's neither Israel nor Gentile. There is an Israel. Okay. Okay. Yahweh did not cast them away. In order for any man to be saved, he has to be grafted into Israel. For he shall save his people. If you want to be saved, then you've got to become his people. You've got to be willing to be grafted into Israel to be saved. To that end, 
Let's look in Acts 15. Let's talk about how we're saved because that subject came up. How do those who are Gentiles, who were not born into the house of Israel, how do they get saved? Acts 15 dealt with that very question. Acts 15 verse 1 says, And certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, Except you be circumcised after the manner of Moses, you cannot be saved. <clears throat> it's not the Pharisees. This is certain from their own group. And they came down and says, Except you be circumcised after the manner of Moses, you cannot be saved. When therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them, that is, they got in a big fight and argument over it. And they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain other of them should go up to Jerusalem under the apostles and elders about this question. Now, now stop and look in verse 1 and ask yourself this question. Why would they think you had to be circumcised to be saved? That's how you became part of Israel. Because number one, Yahweh said he came to save his people. Number two, salvation is of the Jews. You've got to be grafted into Israel. And so they're thinking, well, if that's the way it is, it's logical. It is a logical conclusion to arrive at that a person's not really saved till they get circumcised. If someone wanted to be saved, they needed to be circumcised the same as Israel was. But Paul and Barnabas knew and preached that salvation was by grace through faith. And they said, no, a person does not have to be circumcised to be saved. Salvation is by grace through faith. Well, who was right? The certain Jews who said you have to be circumcised or Paul who said you don't have to be? Well, the correct answer, if you read Acts 15, is neither one of them was right. We think that council proved Paul and Barnabas right. The council actually said neither one of them was right. James, at near the end of Acts 15, we'll start in verse 13, but James tells the Jews, you're wrong to tell people they have to be circumcised. But he's also... Telling Paul, you're wrong to focus on grace and faith only. There's other things that need to be preached besides grace and faith. <clears throat> Have you read Acts 15? He took Paul back to Torah. And said there's some things here that have got to be preached when you're preaching grace and faith. Acts 15, 13. And after they had held their peace, James answered, saying, Men and brethren, hearken unto me. Simeon has declared how Yahweh at the first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And to this agree the words of the prophets as it is written. After this I will return and will build again the tabernacle of David which has fallen down, and I'll build again the ruins thereof, and I'll set it up. That the residue of men might seek after Yahweh. And all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called, says Yahweh, who do, does all these things. So notice that the residue that are going to be saved are those that are seeking after Yahweh and upon whom his name is called. They call on the name of Yahweh. Are you with me? Verse 18, known unto Yahweh are all his works from the beginning of the world. That is, James is saying, Yahweh knew this was going to be an issue, but he's the one who's chosen to save them. So he knew the confusion it was going to create, so there's an answer to it. Verse 19, wherefore my sentence is that we trouble not them which from among the Gentiles are turned to Yahweh. That word trouble means harass. Let's don't harass them. Verse 20. But that we write unto them that they abstain from pollution of idols and from fornication and from things strangled and from blood. I used to call this the big four. 
after looking at it a little closer, I, I don't think it's the big four. I actually think it's the big two. I think that there are two main things James wanted them to focus on. I think idols and fornication go together, and I think strangled and blood go together. Idols lead to fornication, and strangled animals leads to eating blood, because the blood's not drained off. Let's look at the commandment James is referring to. Go to Leviticus 17. He pulls those words straight out of Leviticus 17. Leviticus 17, 7. And they shall no more offer their sacrifice unto devils after whom they have gone a whoring. This shall be a statute forever unto them throughout their generations. <clears throat> the Bible tells us that when you have idols, there are devils attached to them. The devils masquerade, masquerade around as gods. Ithra, Ishtar, Mithra, Zeus. They masquerade as gods. So any sacrifice, let's use this word, activity. Any activity associated with a false god is called whoring. It's not harmless. When Yahweh sees us participating in activities associated with false gods, he calls that whoring. People do not see certain activities that they participate in as being idolatrous. But they are. It doesn't matter if you say you're doing it for Yahweh or not. It doesn't matter if you say, well, he knows what's in my heart. He says these activities were used to worship other gods. If you participate in those activities, I don't care if you say you're doing it for me. I'm telling you, you're whoring after other gods. That's the way they want to be worshipped. It is not the way I'm going to be worshipped. This puts Acts 15 in a whole new light. James is saying that if a Gentile gets saved, they don't have to immediately get circumcised. But, he's saying, in order to demonstrate that they have been saved, they do have to stop immediately participating in activities associated with pagan deities. You can't claim to be saved and keep participating in those activities, James says. We will not tolerate it. We will not allow it. You, we can't preach Saved by grace through faith. And okay, y'all go and do what you're doing. Just know you got Jesus in your heart. He said, no, 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 no. No, that's not enough. We preach you're saved by grace through faith. But if you've been saved by grace through faith, you're going to put aside these pagan activities. You'll no longer participate in them. Those idolatrous acts are committing fornication against Yahweh. And they'll not be tolerated inside the assembly. The, the, James says... The big concern is not whether they've been outwardly circumcised or not. The big concern is whether they've been inwardly circumcised. And the only way to know if they have been inwardly circumcised is to see if they can free themselves from pagan activities. If you hold on to pagan activities, you're demonstrating your heart has not been circumcised. Strangled blood. Strangled and blood. Verse 10. Whatsoever man there be of the house of Israel or of the strangers that sojourn among you that eats any manner of blood, I will even set my face against that soul that eats blood and will cut him off from his people. For the life of the flesh is in the blood and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls for it is the blood that makes an atonement for the soul. Therefore I said unto the children of Israel no soul of you shall eat blood neither shall any stranger that sojourns among you eat blood. And whatsoever man there be of the children of Israel or of the strangers that sojourns among you which hunts and catches any beast or fowl that may be eaten he shall even pour out the blood thereof and cover it with dust. 
all flesh. The blood of it is for the life thereof. Therefore, I said to the children of Israel, You shall eat the blood of no manner of flesh, for the life of all flesh is the blood thereof. Whosoever eats it shall be cut off. Why did uh, James in Act 15 mention strangled? Because when an animal is strangled, the blood's not drained out. And evidently that was a means by which the Gentiles were known for killing their animals. James says, no, 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 no. They can't continue to kill the animals they're going to eat that way. Because they're consuming blood. And that can't be allowed. Leviticus 17 makes it clear. It can't be allowed. A man who will not forsake pagan activities and pagan eating habits has not been saved. That's the point. Let me say that again. A man that will not forsake pagan activities and will not forsake pagan eating habits has not been saved. There is no sign of salvation in that person. It would do no good to circumcise him if he's still participating in pagan activities and pagan approved food. Yeah. Circumcising him would be a waste of time Amen. if his heart hadn't already been circumcised. So in order to come into the assembly, James said there has to be two immediate changes. The rest, he said... Just forget about it. No. No, that's not what he said. Y'all are awake. Every Sabbath they'll hear Moses. They're going to hear Moses where? Where are they going to hear him? In the synagogue. Let the Gentiles go off and start their own little groups. No. Absolutely not. James says we're expecting them to come into the assembly. That meets on the Sabbath in a synagogue. But in order to come into the assembly, they got to do two things real important. They got to quit participating in pagan activities and quit eating according to pagan ways. Right? And then they come in, and when they come in every Sabbath, Moses will be read to them. And the rest of the things they need to, to learn, they'll learn it. Little by little, bit by bit, line upon line, precept upon precept. We've been raised up in this stuff, James says. We're going to see why that's important in Romans 3 in a minute. James said, we've been raised up on this stuff. It's all new to them. We've got to give them room to grow. Acts 15, 21. Moses of old time has in every city them that preach him being read in the synagogues every Sabbath Day. Why would James bring that up if he's not expecting these converts, these new converts, to be instructed in the ways of Torah? Notice that there are four things immediately required of Gentiles who have been saved. Four things immediately required of them. Forsake pagan activity. Forsake pagan food choices. Attend, attend the synagogue and, Lord, and learn Torah. And do that every Sabbath. Forsake pagan activity. Forsake pagan food choices. Attend the synagogue for the purpose of learning Torah. And do that on the Sabbath. Now people are taught the very opposite of that. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> They're taught they can keep doing their pagan ac activities. But this time just do it for Jesus. Yeah. Make this about his birth. Make this one about his resurrection. And we'll take that old satanic one in October and we'll make it about evangelism. The only thing they're taught to forsake is Torah activities. Uh, people are taught to keep eating unclean animals to prove that they've been set at liberty by Jesus. They're taught to forsake what Torah says about clean and unclean. They are taught to attend Sunday services and to learn week after week after week how the law was abolished. 
And they're taught to forsake the Sabbath day and told they don't have to remember it anymore. When Acts 15 makes it clear, forsake the pagan activities, forsake pagan food, attend the synagogue to learn Torah and do that every Sabbath. Salvation is of the Jews. Go to Romans chapter 3. Verse 1. What advantage then has the Jew? Or what profit is there of circumcision? Before you read on, make sure you understand the questions. What advantage has the Jew? You could read that this way. Are the Jews superior? That's what the word advantage means. Do they have preeminence? Are they superior? Do they have some big advantage? And then the next question, is there any benefit to being circumcised? Is it useful at all? The way it's taught today, you'd expect the answers to the questions in verse 1 to be, no, they have no advantage, and no, there's no profit in being circumcised. But read the answer given. <clears throat> Much every way. Much every way. Do they have an advantage? Is there any benefit to being circumcised? The advantage and the benefit given to them is exceedingly great. And everywhere you look, uh, Luke says, everywhere you look, you can see this. It's not Luke, excuse me, Paul. The advantage and benefit that they possess is extremely big. And he said, here's the chief advantage they have. They have been given the oracles of Yahweh. What's another word for oracles? Torah. Or utterances. When Yahweh uttered things, he gave that to them and told them to guard it. Salvation is of the Jews. You cannot be saved and reject the utterances that Yahweh gave to them in Torah. Now, having laid that foundation, I want to show you two or three examples of salvation to illustrate how salvation works. Go to Luke 19. Luke 19 verse 1. And Yeshua entered and passed through Jericho, and behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, which was the chief among the publicans, and he was rich. And he sought to see Yeshua, who he was, and could not for the press, because he was little of stature. And he ran before and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for, for he was to pass that way. And when Yeshua came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said unto him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must abide at your house. And he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all murmured, saying that he, Yeshua, was going to be guest with a man that was a sinner. Zacchaeus didn't have a good reputation. Zacchaeus stood and said unto Yeshua, Behold, Master, the half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I've taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. Zacchaeus' bad reputation is now reflecting badly upon Yeshua. So notice what Zacchaeus did. And Yeshua said unto him, This day is salvation come to this house, for as much as he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. If... If your reputation reflects badly on Yeshua and there are no promptings on the inside of you to change it, salvation is doubtful. Zacchaeus turned his heart to comply with Torah 
and Tanakh, that fourfold concept is, it comes out of 2 Samuel chapter 12. He turned his heart to get into compliance with what is written. Seeing the changes in his behavior, Yeshua announced, salvation's come to this house. When salvation comes, a man's changed. Notice he didn't ask Jesus into his heart. He didn't say, well, I believe in you. What he did is he discovered he's supposed to keep Torah. We're not saved by works. Bible plainly says that. But are people going to correct Yeshua here when he said, Today has salvation come to this house? Are people going to get in Yeshua's face and say, His works have nothing to do with His salvation? Because that's all He did. He said, I'm going to give half my goods to the poor. And if I've taken anything from a man by default or by defraud, defrauding him, I'm going to restore it fourfold. Those are works. Or we're going to get in Yeshua's face and say his works have nothing to do with his salvation. I don't think so. We're saved by grace through faith. But once saved, then we move into the good works that Yahweh has ordained that we should walk in according to Ephesians 2.10. Now let's go look at another one real quick. Keep that one in mind, but let's go to Acts 10. Acts 10 starts off by telling us that there was a centurion by the name of Cornelius. That is, he's a Roman captain over a hundred men. It tells us in Acts 10 that Cornelius was a devout man who feared Yahweh. That he gave alms and he prayed a lot. Why would it tell us all those things if they didn't matter? A devout man feared Yahweh, gave alms, and prayed a lot. One day while he's praying, an angel appeared to him, told him to send for Peter. Then Acts 10 changes, and rather than talking about Cornelius, it then ta- starts telling us about Peter, and tells us that <clears throat> Peter, on the same day that Cornelius sent men to go find Peter, Peter had arrived in Joppa and had gone up on a rooftop to pray. And while he was praying, he got hungry. And when Peter got hungry, he would have stopped to eat lunch. But lunch wasn't ready. So while he's waiting on lunch to be prepared, it says he fell into a trance and he saw the sheet descending from heaven with the unclean animals and heard three times a voice saying, rise, eat. All three times he said, no, sir. Never has anything unclean touched my lips. I'm not going to eat it. So the third time this sheet goes up and it disappears at the end of the vision. And, and Peter's sitting on that rooftop. It says, reasoning within himself. I wonder what in the world that meant. He knew it didn't mean he could go eat a bologna sandwich. Right. What did that mean? And while he's reasoning that in his heart and mind, the men from Cornelius show up, and the Ruach Hakadesh then spoke. There's the difference. The voice that said, rise and eat, we're never told it was Yahweh, never told it was the Ruach Hakadesh. We're just simply told a voice told him. But while he's reasoning, the Ruach Kakadesh spoke and he recognized that voice. And the Ruach Kakadesh said, there's some men down there looking for you. Don't question them. Just go do what they ask you to do. So Peter leaves with those men, arrives at Cornelius' house, and it was then that he knew what the vision meant. And he told Cornelius that. He said, it's against Jewish law for a man that is a Jew to come into the house of a man who's a Gentile. I have just been shown by Yahweh that I'm not to call you unclean ever again. And he went into that man's house. Then we read this. 
When Peter went in, he said to Cornelius, What do you want? Why did you send for me? And Cornelius says, I don't know. <laughs> I was just praying. And while I was praying, a bright being told me to send for you. And so I sent my men for you and I gathered my neighbors and my friends and family here. And we're here to hear whatever you got to say. Verse 34. Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth I perceive that Yahweh is no respecter of persons, but in every nation he, he that fears him and works righteousness is accepted with him. Peter said, I know why Yahweh sent me to you. It's because you fear Yahweh and you work righteousness. How do you work righteousness? Torah. By keeping Torah. And he said, if you fear Yahweh and work righteousness, you get approved of by Yahweh. Accepted of, uh, by Yahweh. Right? So which comes first? Faith in Yeshua or obedience to Torah? Which brings salvation? Faith in Yeshua or obedience to Torah? Peter said that salvation is coming to Cornelius because he has demonstrated that he wants to keep Torah. He's demonstrated that he fears Yahweh. And because he has demonstrated that, he now gets to hear the message of Yeshua. He gets to hear how Yeshua is the anointed, the anointed one of Yahweh sent to take away the sins of the world. Verse 38. How Yahweh anointed Yeshua of Nazareth with a Ruach Kakadesh and with power who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil for Yahweh was with him. Oppressed of the devil means the devil is exercising dominion over them. Yahweh sent Yeshua to deliver us out from under the dominion or the oppression of the devil. Verse 42, and he, this is Peter speaking, says Yeshua, he Yeshua, commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that it is he which was ordained of Yahweh to be the judge of the quick and the dead. Peter says Yeshua commanded us to preach and to testify that Yeshua was ordained of Yahweh to be the judge of the living and the dead. To him give all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believes in him, shall receive remission of sins. So Peter says Yahweh sent his son to save his people from their sins. Yahweh is how, excuse me, Yeshua is how we receive this remission of sins. Believing that he died and was resurrect from, resurrected from the dead and that he is the judge brings salvation. Well, who does it bring salvation to? To those who Yahweh approves. Those who have shown an inclination to Yahweh. Those who are turning toward uh, Torah. Faith, what I'm trying to tell you, always has a corresponding action. All right, I'm going to hurry and bring this to a conclusion. Go to Acts 8. For time's sake, I'm not going to read it all. The story begins in verse 26. Um, Philip joins himself to an Ethiopian eunuch uh, riding in a chariot. And he was right, reading from the book of Isaiah. And Philip runs up to the chariot and says, Sir, do you understand what you're reading? He said, How can I understand it unless somebody explains it? He invited Philip to come up into his chariot and to explain this passage out of the book of I Isaiah. Verse 35, let's pick up there. Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Yeshua. And as they went on their way, they came into a certain water and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What does hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Yeshua HaMashiach is the son of Yahweh. And he commanded the chariot to stand still and they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of Yahweh caught away Philip. 
and that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. So again, he had some works before he had faith in Yeshua. But notice it's always faith and works. Zacchaeus had works. Cornelius had works. The Ethiopian had works. They just needed to hear about Yeshua and how Yahweh sent him to save them from their sins. And they needed to believe that he died and was raised and that he had authority over death, hell, and the grave. Now people are hearing about Yeshua, but nothing about Torah. So I close, I think, with this. James 2. What does it profit, my brethren, though a man say... I'm in verse 14. What does it profit, my brethren, though a man say he has faith and has not works? Can faith save him? Can faith alone save him? The vast majority of churches today would say what to that question? Yes. Yeah. yes. But if you believe that faith alone can save, then you've got to tear the book of James out of your Bible. If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto him, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding you give them not those things which are needful to the body, what does it profit? Even so, faith, if it has not works, is dead being alone. If that's all you got, it's worthless. Yea, a man may say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works. I'll show you my faith by my works. You believe there's one Elohim? You do well. The devils also believe and tremble. Will you say, O oh, vain man, that faith without works is dead? Oh, excuse me, what will you know, O oh vain man? That faith without works is dead. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? See thou how faith wrought with his works, and by works was, made, was faith made perfect. And the scripture also was fulfilled, which said, Abraham believed Elohim. It was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of Yahweh. You see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. Likewise also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works when she had received the messengers and had sent them out another way? For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. I saw a few years ago, and once you see it, you can't unsee it. I saw a few years ago that it is very evident that James wrote his epistle to combat the false doctrines that were being taught by people who were reading Paul's letters. It's not that Paul was saying it, but the unlearned were twisting Paul's words. And they were saying, all we got to do is have faith. And James's letter is written to combat that thinking. Faith without works is dead. Believe in Yeshua. Believe that Yahweh sent him. Believe that Yahweh put on him the sins of us all. Believe that Yahweh raised him from the dead and given him power and authority. Then... Walk as he walked. 1 John 2, 4. He that says, I know him and keeps not his commandments is a liar. And the truth is not in him. Whosoever keeps his word in him, verily is the love of Yahweh perfected. Hereby know we that we are in him. He that says he abides in him ought himself also to walk as he walked. Perhaps... We have seen fewer baptisms of the Holy Spirit because we have left out the vital part of salvation that includes an inclination to obedience. Why would the Ruach Hakadesh enter into a person who has no desire to walk in Torah? Right.
The Bible is our source for doctrine. Show me one example of somebody being converted who did not have knowledge of Yahweh and an inclination to keep Torah. And or an inclination to keep Torah. You go look in Acts 2 where the 3,000 are saved. They're there celebrating the feast. So their inclination is to Yahweh. They just needed to hear about how the Messiah was sent to bear their sins. They got saved. Every conversion in the scripture refers to people who have the faith of Yeshua and keep the commandments. Go read the book of Revelation. <clears throat> A dragon does war with them who have the faith of Yeshua and keep the commandments. And so we mentioned this last week when somebody says, well, yeah, but what about the thief on the cross? Both of those men showed knowledge of Yahweh and showed knowledge of Torah. And could recognize that there was supposed to be a Messiah and that this might be him. Alright? So every conversion you see in the scripture is people calling on the name of Yahweh, believing in Yeshua, and who have a desire to walk in the commandments. This is um, in Acts chapter 2. Peter's preaching and he says to those men before the 3,000 are saved, he said, For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, as many as Yahweh our Elohim shall call. The promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as many as Yahweh our Elohim shall call. I think we leave out that important part of salvation. We want people to think they're in charge of their salvation. That they can just say a prayer anytime they want to and get saved. They don't have to worry about changing anything. They just got to ask Jesus into their heart and be saved. But the truth of the matter is that Yahweh has to call us. Cornelius, Yahweh saw something in him, and Yahweh sent Peter to call him. Zacchaeus, Yeshua, called him. There's got to be some inclination in us that wants to know Yahweh and walk according to his statutes if salvation is to come. Yahweh bless you and keep you. Yahweh make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. Yahweh lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. As his name is put upon you, so shall he himself bless you.